Hi everybody, um, I'm going to kick off and welcome everyone to the National Liberal Club's Sustainability Forum. Uh, I'm Emma, I sit on the membership committee for the club. I also run events here and in my working life I'm a senior criminologist and I also volunteer with One Young World. Uh, for the forum we really set it up because we realised this was pre-lockdown, can I just say, um, that we have an awful lot of members that work in sustainability really care about it and actually are doing really amazing things. Um, so this is a bit of a lockdown baby. So we came up with the forum. Um, just going to mute all. Sorry, guys. Um, and so we came up with the forum as a way to kind of bridge that gap as a club that is political. So we have Liberal, um, Conservative and Labor members. We really thought we could be a centre for thought and discussion. How the forum is going to work is that we are going to do headline events such as this with really ama amazing speakers such as Rebecca, um, but also do some back to basic sessions such as what is climate change? What is greenwashing? Uh, how do we change behaviour? Then have very specific finance networking sessions and finance education sessions for people who work in finance. Then also we'll be talking about government as well as arts because as a criminologist uh, past behaviour is the best predictor of future behaviour and arts for me anyway is really key in imagining a bit of a different way forward and it's actually really useful. Um, in policing we definitely use uh, what, what movies have done to uh, sort of think about what we're doing so I thought that was hugely important. So if you'd like to be involved, speak, or anything like that, please just contact me. Um, but without uh, interrupting the evening further, I'm going to hand over to the stars of the evening. So I'd really like to introduce Lord David Chidgy, who is the president of our network. And David is a Liberal Democratic peer. He's served in the House of Lords since 2005. Prior to that, he was the MP for Eastleigh from 1994. And he also sits on the United Nations All Parliamentary, All Party Parliamentary Group for the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'll hand it over to you now, David. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, and can I just say how delighted I am to be the president of this hugely important network. As a Liberal Democrat, I, I believe that we can bring people together from across the political spectrum and have thought-provoking and productive discussions over the sustainability debate. And I'm particularly committed to the development of transparent and accountable democratic institutions and I see this as crucial to supporting the, the sustainable development goals. Now as Emma mentioned I'm actually the vice chair of the all-party parliamentary group on the UN global goals for sustainable development and just at the moment we're midway through our inquiry into the sustainable development goals and the impact of COVID-19. In fact we held an evidence session this morning and one previously on Monday afternoon. We will also be conducting one-to-one -one interviews and focus groups with expert stakeholders, resulting in a report outlining the evidence and making recommendations to the government to ensure that goals are at the center of recovery efforts in 2020 and beyond. The report should be published around the end of September. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Rebecca Self. Rebecca is the Director of Sustainable Finance at South Pole and a former Head of Sustainable Finance at HSBC. In her current role, Rebecca is responsible for the consultancy services offered to financial institutions globally, which combine climate science-led data and business integration advice. The consultancy services focus on three areas, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, Sustainable Development Goal, SDG, Impact Analysis for Financial Products, and Supporting Financial Institutions with their Net Zero Commitments. In her previous role at HSBC, Rebecca was responsible for the group-wide financials relating to sustainable de finance projects, products, sorry, including sustainability green bonds, ESG, environmental and social governance, asset management and private bank funds, and sustainability related commercial lending. In addition, in addition, Rebecca was responsible for HSBC's external ESG reporting and investor relations activity. Rebecca is currently studying a master's from the University of Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership I'm going to welcome her now, but before I do, 
I'm just going to remind you that we will throw open the forum uh, to a question and answer session for all those participants uh, watching us and listening to us on Zoom. So Rebecca, it's over to you. Thank you very much and glad to be with you today. Um, I have some slides, uh, so I'll go through those. Um, let me just share my screen. And the presentation today will be around 15, 20 or so minutes long. It will be divided into three parts. The first being the context and why this is important. The second, an introduction to sustainable finance. And then finally, policy and levers. And um, apologies, uh, some of you may have heard some of this before. You may already be aware of it. Uh, so it might be a bit of a recap but it's such a broad scope, um, it's just going through those in uh, somewhat orderly fashion. So getting started and the context. The Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 by approximately 200 countries. And Sorry, Rebecca, we've not got your screen yet. Ah. Bear with me a moment. Got it now. Good. Thank you. Okay. There we go. So hopefully that's working now. Thank you. Um, so the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 by approximately 200 countries. And that agreed to attempt uh, to keep global emissions between one and a half and two degrees by 2100 and there are various different transition trajectories shown here and this shows global carbon emissions and the pathway to achieve those different temperature goals um, and global carbon emissions are one of the biggest contributors uh, to global warming but there are other contributors too such as nitrogen such as methane now one of the reasons in the a vast number why it's so important to keep within this temperature is biodiversity impacts it's estimated uh, by the intergovernmental panel on climate change the climate scientists so that there'll be an 18 percent reduction in insects and a 15 percent reduction in plants and other wildlife if these goals aren't met so between one and a half to two degrees but the the impacts of climate change won't be distributed equally across the globe. In some countries, there could be extreme droughts and poverty. We've already seen some of that come through, for example, in the Middle East. Um, in other countries, uh, there could be more extreme uh, weather, such as storms. And for instance, in London the, and in the UK, the water holding capacity of the air is likely to increase by up to 7% even if we keep to one and a half uh, degrees. If that increases to 7%, you get more extreme weather. So typically in London, that means drier spells, more humidity in the air, and then increased heavy torrential rainfall over a very short period of time, increasing surface water flooding and potentially having uh, subsidence uh, for houses and for property. And I think we're seeing some of that come through already in what we're experiencing day by day, albeit that's weather rather than climate. But these really are very big, significant impacts if we don't meet those goals. UN Sustainable Development Goals are 17 goals with around 170 indicators beneath. And they cover a whole range of different areas climate being one, but also a number of social impacts also. Um, and therefore, private finance for public or policymakers uh, to all achieve. Um, there are some individual goals called the good life goals, which are the sustainable development goals for individuals. And one of the things I do um, is actually try and tick those off myself. Um, so those good life goals, I'd really encourage you to have a look at. And maybe just drilling into one of the goals in particular, which is number 12, responsible consumption and production. 
typically um, the way that the economic um, system and production has worked uh, since industrial times is in a very linear fashion, which means digging something out of the ground. Um, it could be a fossil fuel, it could be something else, doing some processing and then putting it back in the ground uh, quite often in landfill. So a very linear straight line uh, way of processing and producing. And there are now eight billion people on the planet, even more um, likely projected. And if you take the amount of resources which we have in the earth um, or around the earth, which we have available to consume and average those um, by the typical person, um, you come up with a sort of average amount that we can consume as individuals. Now, right now, um, if we look at that consumption um, in Northern Europe, and it does depend on your habits, typically on average, we consume around five times on average the Earth's resources per individual. Um, for some, it might be more, for some, it might be less. If you turn to North America, typically people are consuming on average around eight times the annual resources which the Earth is producing and replenishing and has available. So that means using steady state economics, steady state growth assumptions, we will simply run out of uh, resources as a planet. And depending on what it is, um, there are different timescales where we'll run out. Uh, for example, soil um, and the use of fertilizer, um, which is degrading soil, is projected to only last for approximately 70, so seven zero more harvests. Um, but there's a whole range of others uh, indicators there. Now, responsible consumption and production is to move from that very linear processing, linear way of thinking about economics, to instead um, a more circular way of thinking. That could be recycling. So rather than putting things back in the ground, uh, reusing them, it could be eliminating waste. Um, and there are a number of different products that do that, so circular type products. Um, but it could also be simply not taking the resources out of the ground to begin with and acting within constraints. Um, and there's a uh, economic uh, theory by Kate Rayworth, um, which is donut economics, which is working within those planetary con and social constraints, which is one example there. Um, so I think the circular economy and really focusing on SDG 12 um, is very important. But within the SDGs, there are a number of different trade-offs um, among them. Um, so it's also important to recognize achieving them all um, will be a challenge. And there are these tensions and trade-offs that occur in particular with SDG eight, uh, which is de decent work and economic growth. If you have economic growth and you have these constraints, there can be that tension. So moving on to sustainable finance we've gone a bit through the context and what it is so it's usually defined as uh, the finance sector so banks insurance asset managers pension schemes taking into account environmental social and governance considerations when when decisions are being made and after all these organizations are looking after our own money it's usually individuals money um, and corporate money that they're looking after. Um, and there are some great initiatives uh, which, are, which are going on. Increasingly, um, there are investment criteria that are looking to um, include carbon emissions in some of their analysis. Um, and there are also reports, for example, the Stern report, um, which had an update, it's about 10 years old, it had an update a couple of years ago, which showed um, if we keep to those Paris Agreement goals within the next 15 years uh, and act on those very proactively, we can reduce poverty, we can work on renewables, some of these new sectors and have growth at the same time. Um, so it's not a mutually exclusive thing. So why doesn't this happen today? Well, one of the answers is short termism and human behaviour. Um, and the so-called uh, tragedy of the horizon, um, which is the name from Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England. As humans, we're very good at reacting to something immediate that's in front of us, but climate change may take a really long time to play out. 
um, and that makes it more challenging for us to, for, it, for us to deal with it right now. And also incentives are structured typically in a very short term way. Um, working in the finance sector, a huge amount of attention is paid to the next quarter's results or the next year's results. Um, but looking much further beyond that before, well, further than five or 10 years can be much more challenging. And indeed, if you look at uh, high frequency trading, for just for instance, which is looking at nanoseconds, there's a huge amount of value paid to a real short term view. So this is a really um, important point. Um, and it applies not just to the finance sector, but also uh, to policy. Um, and I would suggest with elections as well, there's sometimes a very short news cycle or a very short focus cycle rather than focusing on that longer term approach in some instances. Um, one of the other areas here which is challenging is measuring metrics over the long term and series of assumptions and estimates that have to be undertaken. Um, and one of the questions that I often ask myself is about that measurement piece, how we can get long term thinking uh, more included into financial presentations and thinking. And there's two items I'd like to mention there. One is the long term project. And there's some work in the Nordics uh, where they've been looking at focus groups to bring in some of that long term thinking into policy in particular. And the other is a book um, called The Good Ancestor. Um, and that actually encourages thinking, not just for our own lifetimes, but perhaps if we have children, nieces, nephews, young people in our lives, thinking about their children and the type of challenges that they may face and how we can be good ancestors today. Two slides here, just focusing back again onto uh, financial products. One is the spectrum of capital. And this is really focused on investments. Um, so there's a whole series of different types of investments. On the left hand side, we have the more traditional asset management funds. So where people's money is being invested. Typically, no ESG considerations are being taken into account. They can invest in anything. At the other end, on the right hand side, uh, there's philanthropic or charity where no financial return is, is expected. And then a whole range of things in between. Now, what's growing right now is the responsible section where there's avoiding harm. So it doesn't necessarily have a positive impact, but it does. Those investments do try to achieve a do no harm principle. So that means excluding um, investments in uh, cluster munitions. It could be coal and other types of sectors and organizations, and that's growing. In the capital markets as well, um, so product focus for markets, there are also other types of products which are under development um, and growing. Um, and this will be bone, bonds or loans, um, which integrate sustainability metrics. And the green line that you see here is green bonds. Um, and this is where the bond is raised using the financial markets, uh, money from investors, and it's used exclusively for green projects which are verified. Now that's growing at quite a rate, but to put it into context, the entire fixed income capital markets is typically around 100 trillion US dollars per year of capital raised. And right now, green bonds are about 2%. So yes, it's growing, but there's a huge amount more to do. Um, and if I look at the economy in general, that 2% is probably reflective of the volume of green activity. Meanwhile, you have 20, 25%, which is in higher carbon intensive areas, oil, gas, uh, buildings, mining, etc., and then a whole range of things in between. So analyzing that mix um, can be quite challenging and the green needs to grow but we also need to focus on the transition of all of the other sectors. Um, one point actually just to mention on bonds is increasingly now there are um, COVID released bonds where um, the bonds are actually issued from the capital markets and the use of proceeds goes uh, to um, uh, projects uh, which will have COVID relief. Uh, so that's another quite new and emerging area. And then to briefly talk about some of the drivers. Well, there's good news. Um, there are many activities and 
um, I found myself um, when Larry Fink of BlackRock, um, which is one of the biggest asset managers uh, in the world, which has seven trillion of funds under management, when Larry Fink released his letter, and there's an extract here, uh, this year, I myself was inundated by requests uh, in my former role um, because people were really taking notice that BlackRock was making these statements. There are also other uh, types of asset managers here, Climate Action 100 Plus, who are working in this area, and they have around 40 trillion of assets under management. And the NGFS is another. So this is a network of central banks of supervisors who are looking at this issue, climate change, and looking at potential financial stability impacts which could happen uh, over time to the company, companies that they manage and supervise. And then finally, to man mention COVID, over the past uh, few months, uh, the S&P 500, and this is a little bit dated now, a few weeks old, the S&P 500 stock index was down around 24%. But if you then looked at those funds and the stocks which were defined as responsible, so that second bucket that I mentioned where there's a do no harm, they were down 12%. Um, so there is that economic lever that seems to be coming through now. The, the companies that are more responsible, do no harm, implement ESG, are performing in a more resilient way than their counterparts. There are a number of other drivers. Uh, the UN Environmental Programme for Financial Institutions has the principles of responsible investment. Uh, there's around 3,000 asset managers who have signed. And then also the principles of responsible banking as around 170 uh, global banks who have signed. And in the EU, there's a taxonomy on sustainable finance. So defining exactly what it is. And then the final slide here is around uh, some different initiatives uh, which are becoming uh, more and more relevant. Um, just to mention a couple. Um, so TCFD is a new initiative from 2017, um, chaired uh, by Mike Bloomberg, and it came under the FSB, the, the uh, Financial Stability Board, so G20 countries. And it asks companies, and over 700 multinationals have now signed up to do this, to analyze their governance, their strategy, set metrics and targets, and perform scenario analysis related to climate change on their business. So how climate change will impact them. And in Canada, for instance, one of the conditions for, for getting bailout loans, COVID related, is to file a TCFD report. Um, so we're seeing that, that increasingly come through. Also, net zero is another. And in the UK, uh, we have the Climate Change Act. Um, this is around having net zero emissions by 2050 um, and either achieving that by reducing the amount of global emissions, um, so turning off the tap or slowing the tap, or in some cases having offsets or avoiding those emissions too. Um, so there's a number of initiatives in there. And overall, I think there's a huge amount going on. Um, I am optimistic, uh, even though there are some real doom and gloom scenarios, there are so many things going on, which um, often can be a lot of noise. Um, but I think trying to measure and understand these impacts is really important. Trying to quantify them where we can with estimates and assumptions. Uh, the Chartered Accountants Institute, for example, has put out more guidance. Um, around how accountants can do that. I'm a chartered accountant myself. And I think it's very easy to point out lots of the things that are wrong um, and certainly lots of the things that, that companies are doing which may not be quite right or individuals are doing which may not be quite right. Um, but I, personally, I try to congratulate those where I see things which are good or I see that efforts are being made. Um, and I think progress we should celebrate, but recognising there's still a long way to go. Um, and I would just finish off um, by saying the power of collaboration in this area is really important. Uh, we have COP26 in Glasgow next year, and these issues will not be solved by individuals or companies or countries. It will take a big global effort and us all talking to one another 
in a whole bunch of different ways of different forums, sometimes disagreeing with one another, but to really try and work through those solutions and avoid those unintended consequences. So I think the, uh, the initiative from uh, the Liberal Club is, is a really great one. And I really try and encourage those uh, conversations wherever I can. And uh, all the best. Oh, pause there for now. I think we're going to some questions. Emma, that was, thank you for introducing this. And Rebecca, thank you very much for a very thought provoking presentation. I'm quite sure this is going to start a, a conversation which will go on and on and on until we eventually find some ways forward. Now, um, we have, a, a, hopefully this is going to work. <laughs> we have a number of, of members and colleagues and guests, I think we want to contribute by asking questions. So. Um, Tim McNally, uh, all of Tim McNally is, is holding the master controls here, which is, <laughs> it means I can honestly say it's not my fault if it goes wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, so, so David, I've, I've sent you by, on, in your chat window, a list of people. There's somebody in this room and then- Yeah, it's okay, Tim. Shush, shush, shush. I've got that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm still going to blame you. <laughs> right, here we go. I've now got the chat room up. I know that, uh, uh, Subu Loganathan wants to come in with a question, uh, and we have several after that as well. So uh, I, I can't see Subu anywhere, but I presume he's going to leap into the frame any second. Can, uh, can you mute? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, apologies. Yeah, we, are the, we are the terrace, and there's a... There's a there are two or three laptops and Zoom sessions going on at the same time. Um, so um, my question was, um, as more and more firms move towards sustainability and um, trying to be um, to publish more ESG metrics, uh, we hear about something called greenwashing where firms may not actually want uh, to be sustainable or may not have the right supply chains to do it. How, how do you envision um, tackling such uh, a case where, people, where companies are trying to get by with window dressing and how do you identify um, such um, bad actors, if you will? Rebecca. Thank you. Um, and it's a good question. I think for the financial services sector in particular in this area, there's a lot of talk. <laughs> um, and sometimes there's not much do when you, when you look at what's left. Um, and so there's a few areas, well, a few thoughts I'd have there. Firstly, um, initially I was quite uncomfortable at the amount of talk without the walk, but actually it does help. And I, I do think when those commitments get made, um, people do work through them. So yes, it can be a bit uncomfortable, um, but um, I think living with it to some extent is important. Now, having said that, there are two things that I tend to, to look at. Firstly, I'm always very interested in the question, what don't you do? Because a lot of companies will talk about all the amazing things they do and the projects they finance, et cetera, et cetera, all the good news. And I'm like, tell me what you need to improve, tell me what you don't finance. And that's often where the rubber hits the road. Um, there's also some good resources from the World Resources Institute, which is an NGO, which compares banks' commitments, their green commitments, with the amount of their fossil fuel lending. So you can quickly see a, a difference. Um, and Share Action, uh, the NGO, the, the charity that represents shareholders also has some of that analysis. And then finally, um, there's a really great resource for individuals, which is called Make My Money Matter. And that's about how to orientate your own pension schemes in a genuinely green or sustainable fashion. Thank you, Rebecca. Now, I understand we, we have a question coming up in the Naroji room. Uh, perhaps we could we could hear from them. Uh, thank you, David. Um, so uh, I'd like to answer this from a, a couple of different angles. Uh, my, my name is Ian Riley. I, I represent the cement industry. I'm CEO of the World Cement Industry, uh, World Cement Association, which is a, 
uh, industry body based here in London. And as you guys probably know, uh, the cement industry is responsible for about 7% of uh, uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, it, it was one of the industries that recognized fairly early that this was a problem uh, and has been working on this for yeah, at least 20 years. But the levers that we have today and the levers that we've been working on uh, for those 20 years will only take us so far, maybe another quarter to a third reduction in the uh, uh, emissions that we have. Because most of the emissions come from the process, uh, inherent to the process. Um, so one of the things that we look at is uh, that there's a lot of new technologies that have a lot of promise. Uh, but the pace of development of new technologies and the pace of adoption of new technologies, it could be faster. It, you know, they, they progress, but they don't progress as fast as they could. And I was very interested, uh, uh, Rebecca, that you mentioned PRI. And PRI have a, 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 um, a scenario which I think they call IPR, Inevitable Policy Response. And the, uh, the idea behind this is that in about 2025, uh, governments will come under a lot of pressure from uh, their publics uh, because of observable climate change and will initiate um, much more um, severe or much stricter restrictions and incentives uh, uh, to uh, reduce uh, CO2 emissions. So I guess one way or another that implies a price on carbon. Um, so I think that the, if I look at our industry, and I think it applies to many industries, uh, I believe that the lack of incentives is one of the things that is limiting the speed of progress. And I, I, I wonder, um, Rebecca, whether uh, you see companies starting to consider this IPR scenario, and even though the incentives aren't there today, are they anticipating that incentives will be put in place in a few years' time uh, and, and starting to accelerate uh, um, action that will result in, in uh, uh, CO2 reductions. So, thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca, what's your view on this? Thank you for the question. Um, and one of my bugbears, I think, with many, many industries and many sectors, it's very easy to characterize them as good and green or they're bad and brown and actually there's a whole range of all sorts of things in between and it varies uh, considerably as well even within a, a particular sector like building materials uh, mark carney talks about 50 shades of green um, and i think there's probably even more than 50 um, so cement cement being one of the more challenging harder to abate sectors but a range uh, of different practices there and on the incentives in particular, um, so I do see increasingly some companies, now it's a minority, who are increasingly looking at those uh, longer term incentives and building them into scorecards. So management, um, variable compensation scorecards, um, or some form of annual remuneration review. It's not 100%. Um, so it's not ever 100% of pay, but usually where I've seen best practice, it's been circa sort of 25 or 30%. It's usually about carbon emissions today, but then with some form of scenario built in. Um, but even then, when we talk about long term, it tends to just be looking at three to four years and carbon emissions reducing and implementing some form of scenario analysis rather than the outcome of what a scenario analysis may tell you. Um, so I think one of the other thoughts that I have there is really on well, it's sort of the finance and the policy side coming together. Um, I think to incubate some of these um, new uh, technologies, new industries, they're often quite high risk. And if there's more of a policy support there to support investors, to, to support finance, um, so it's something more blended, uh, they, that may help to grow some of those sectors because they're, they're not without financial risk. In fact, the opposite. Can I, thank, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. I, I just want to hey, check. Can I just follow up with a question for you? I'm sorry, I'm, they, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying, but I do know that there was somebody in the 
uh, in uh, in Tim's list who wanted to ask a question. I just wanted to check to see if that's still the case. Uh, Chris Carey was, I think, on the list. Was that right? Yes, yes. that's correct. Um, go ahead, Chris. Hey, so thanks again to the uh, NRC for putting this on. I think it's a great initiative. It's good to, you know, open our eyes to this sort of thing. It's becoming more prevalent. And so I think it's important that we focus on it. Um, I, I just had a quick question um, for Rebecca. You know the green bonds. Do you know the entity that um, actually decides whether a bond is green? For instance, uh, Visa came to the market yesterday, or the day before, uh, with a $500 billion bond, um, which is going to be used to help to advance the company's commitment to environmental sustainability and the sustainable payments ecosystem. But do you know of the, the body or the group, if there even is one, who does that. And then second of all, could you repeat that S&P statistic that you um, mentioned earlier? Rebecca. Sure, so on green bonds, um, the green bonds framework is organized by ICMA. So that's the International Capital Markets Association. And they define what is, what is meant by a green bond. When an okay. issuer goes to market, uh, they'll usually have some form of uh, reporting associated with that green bond approximately a year after they issue, and that has a second party opinion. Uh, so generally that's the process. Um, there's a range, range of second party opinion providers. Um, and then on the statistic on the S&P, um, so it is maybe a few weeks out of date, uh, but it was looking at the beginning of lockdown, so it was around April, um, and the S&P being down at 24%, but the ESG, and it was the MSCI index, ESG index, being down 12%. Very Thank interesting. You. Yeah, I was, I was going to, I was going to mention that. I think one of the reasons that attributes to that is because um, a lot of the companies which are within that index are, you know, using technology and harvesting, well, using technology to be able to disrupt industries as well, which means that they're more popular, um, and it's sort of disrupting the old economy stocks, if you will, and so they're getting a lot more love and a lot more dollars, as you said, behind them as well. And I think that's also a reason for the disparity. If you look now, for instance, year to date, the difference between that one that you mentioned is, um, no, it's not loading there. The S&P is up 6% and that's up 7%. But I understand what you mean, especially when everyone was trying to sell everything that was liquid. Um, that was, that's a very interesting statistic. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for thank uh, you, volunteering Chris. your time. Thank you, Chris, for, for, for um, that question. Now, uh, I have a Shiksha man wants to put a question to Rebecca. Hi, uh, thanks again for organizing. Um, I have a quick question. When we uh, talk about green bonds or environmental uh, work that the companies do, a lot of times it's bundled with social causes as well. Uh, Rebecca, do you think that uh, this leads to dilution of the cause or do you think bundling with other causes helps focus the companies to focus on a lot more cause, uh, causes and helps in driving some kind of benefit? due to the bundling of the causes. Rebecca. Yes, thank you. And perhaps um, using the SDGs as a frame there. So there are 17 SDGs and they're both social and environmental uh, and governance in nature. Um, and uh, I think for a company to try and achieve all 17 and to achieve all 170 indicators beneath is probably virtually impossible. Um, Having said that, it's important that companies don't cherry pick. So they can't just focus on uh, the ones that they choose um, and the ones which are good. Um, so what I tend to favor is, what I, what I do favor is that a company completes a principled prioritization. They look at the SDGs or the areas which are the most relevant for their business, their customers um, and uh, their employees. So that probably includes a combination of environmental and social because nearly all companies will have social I don't think it's one or the other um, but I think that prioritization has to be credible it has to be done in quite a structured way and not just looking at the positive impacts but also negative impacts where a company may contribute as well so I don't think it dilutes the message to look at many different aspects 
but you really have to focus on those which are the most relevant for your business and the most material. It can't just be, um, I sort of talk about a cliche, brochures with lots of faces of smiling children and wind farms. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. Um, we've had a, a fantastic run so far, but you are getting very short of time. Uh, I'd just like to put one, one question myself, if I may. It's, it's more of a, a philosophical um, observation, but it may generate some response. We'll see. Uh, there's a movement in, in the political arena these days that tells us that uh, sustainable growth is no longer possible. In fact, it's an oxymoron. And so the question I would like to put to everybody, really, is which of the two philosophical schools of thought is likely to be best able to address the problems that we now have? Is it socialist democracy or liberal democracy? I'll leave that thought with you, unless you want to come back on me. <laughs> Rebecca, no? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I'll leave it with you. I, I think... I think we're running out of time anyway, so um, it seems to me there's a nice way for me to finish, but um, I'll leave that with you. Uh, so I now have to uh, call on, on Tim, uh, Tim McNally, to, to offer his conclusion, and I think he wants to invite uh, some feedback. So Tim, over to you. <laughs> uh, sorry, David, there was one more question. I don't know whether you saw that. Um, which is ben, no. <laughs> ben, ben Riley. Oh, right, that the anonymous one. Yeah. Right, let's go on to the anonymous one from Ben Riley. That doesn't make sense, does it? Um, quickly, Rebecca, this is the question. What opportunities are there to bridge the cultural and operational divides of the, not, of the non-profit and for-profit sectors? Bit like my question, really. Yeah, and, and there, I do think, yeah, there's, there's definitely social and cultural differences. Um, I think the whole concept, I mean, collaboration, talking, blended finance, bringing people together, really important. Um, and I think, that, you know, there are a number of foundations uh, within private sector companies that we will we'll be working or incubating with some of the more philanthropic institutions. Um, so that could be a way to sort of try and cross fertilize. Um, and on the question on sustainable growth, I mean, I'm not going to get into a, a philosophical debate, but <laughs> I do wonder about um, how we define growth and looking sort of relentlessly at financial GDP, you know, is, is there more of a, a different types of growth, both social, personal, so beyond pure economic growth. Um, and there's the triple bottom line, which means looking not only at profits, but also people and the planet. And I think being sort of agnostic about politics, but I think that's conceptually really important. Um, yeah, and I think the power of collaboration sort of crosses all of that. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you. That was very helpful. Tim, do you want to take over now? Thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to thank Rebecca for a fascinating talk. I, I, I mean, sustainability is really key to us here at the NLC, and I'm so grateful to both Emma and uh, Lord David Chigi for taking the lead in setting up the NLC Sustainability Forum. And I hope that all of you will take part in it going forwards uh, and will help Emma uh, with her ambitious programme for a, a meeting a month uh, and uh, really driving this forward.